listening to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life podcast. I'm Janine Strong, and every two weeks I have an inspiring conversation with an ordinary person leading an extraordinary life. And today is no exception. I'm honored to have as my guest, Dr. Stephanie Seneff. I've been following her work for some time now. Dr. Stephanie Seneff is a senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in Cambridge, Mass. She has a BS degree in biology and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. Both are from MIT. Her recent interests have focused on the role of toxic chemicals and micronutrient deficiencies in health and disease, with a special emphasis on one of my favorites, the pervasive herbicide Roundup, and also the mineral sulfur. She has authored over 30 peer-reviewed journal papers over the past few years on these topics. Hello, Dr. Seneff. It's so good to have you here. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. May I call you Stephanie? You may. Thank you. Great. Um, so I love to hear, I know this is a passion of yours, and I would love to hear how you became interested in all of this and what led you to this. Yeah, well, it really started out with autism, and I, uh, I have been intrigued by autism for many years, and I noticed about maybe 10 or 12 years ago uh, that the rates were rising uh, alarmingly fast, basically mm -hmm. an exponential growth curve. Um, and this really had me alarmed, and I was frustrated that most of the research dollars were going towards genetics, and exponential growth is not a genetic problem. I mean, there could be genetic predisposition, but it's not the source of the disease mm -hmm. or not the source of the epidemic. Right. So I wanted to figure out what it was in the environment. I thought if I take a look, maybe I can find something. Um, I just really felt it needed to be my problem because I just cared enough. And um, and I started really with vaccines, and I looked at mercury and aluminum in vaccines. And I was looking at other issues uh, with respect to processed foods and whatnot. But I was really um, learning a lot about autism, but not really figuring out, not coming across anything that made sense as far as being the obvious cause. Um, and it was really like for, uh, fortuitous about maybe six years ago that I happened to be at a conference where a guy named Professor Don Huber was giving a talk on glyphosate, two-hour presentation. Mm -hmm. At that time, I didn't know what glyphosate was, I'm embarrassed to say. But um, <laughs> I thought, well, this sounds interesting. Maybe I'll learn something. And I attended the talk, and I was blown away because I, he was explaining how glyphosate causes the things that I was seeing in autism. It just felt, felt like it fit like a glove. I just felt this is it. I really had kind of an instinctive feeling this is it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, went home and learned, started learning everything I could about glyphosate and uh, really became more and more convinced. The more I looked, the more convinced I became that glyphosate is not now not only the cause of the autism epidemic, but also the cause of an epidemic in a long, long list of debilitating and, and um, chronic autoimmune diseases and whatnot. It's just, I believe glyphosate is the reason why we have a healthcare crisis in this country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I was having a conversation with a couple of people the other day, and we were talking about how, like, when I was in school, nobody had autism that I knew of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe there was maybe some Down syndrome, maybe some cerebral palsy, but, um, you know, nobody had allergies, to food right. that I knew of. I mean, it's just all of these issues were, they, mm -hmm. they just weren't something that was, that, that was given any focus. It wasn't all pervasive like, like they are now. Yeah. I remember as a child, um, I tried to think back, you know, and I could remember one child in the grade behind me who had asthma, which was kind of fascinating to me that she had asthma. It was such, you know, such a new and interesting thing to me. And mm -hmm. Nobody had anything else. There was no ADHD. There were no food allergies. I can't remember anything. Right. You know, nothing. And anybody, not just my grade, but in the school. Right. You know? That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious because you're a research scientist at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. So what what were you doing before you became interested in this? <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> And it, it is quite a change, actually. I mean, I've gotten interested in, uh, I've always been interested in biology. Obviously, I have an undergraduate degree in biology. I've always loved it. I've always, you know, read about things biological throughout my life. 
my work was in computer science. I developed, I was about one of the early birds developing the precursors to things like Siri and Amazon's Echo, you know, those sort of software interfaces that allow computers to engage in spoken dialogue with uh, humans mm -hmm. to uh, gain access to information sources. We were doing that first, really. We were one of the pioneers in that space. And uh, I had, by the time I, I started to get worried about autism, I was lucky to be able to, I was doing research at that time on uh, building dialogue games, uh, interactive dialogue games for language learning. So it's like practicing your mm. Chinese, mm -hmm. totally different. You know, um, I loved it actually. And I was quite excited about the idea of learning a, a foreign language through, through games to try to make it an enter entertaining process. Games with the computer and even interactive games with the computers facilitating the game. Mm -hmm. That uh, does sound interesting. Yeah. And I, I loved it, but I, uh, but I did sort of transition from that into medical databases and, and looking at correlations between disease and a drug of side effects and, and the vaccine adverse event reporting system. I was looking at statistics there to try to find correlations between um, chemicals and disease, I guess, you know, and then of course mm -hmm. looking at chemicals in the environment. And my, and luckily my funder, I have the same uh, company funding me now that was funding me then with it at language learning, they were happy to switch over to something more of a medical, you know, in a medical space. Oh, nice. Uh, it was a smooth transition. So it's really been great for me that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to have private funding to do this kind of research? I don't know, but I haven't been successful in getting government funding from the United States. Uh, my funding is from Taiwan. A oh, my goodness. A company in Taiwan called Quanta, Quanta Computers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's fascinating. So they're also, they're interested in this work that you're doing that doesn't have anything to do with computers. Right. I know. It's actually really great. I mean, it actually does have, uh, they are interested in the medical domain and they're interested in using, uh, building, you know, databases for collecting medical information and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So they, they do have an interest in the medical domain with respect to computers. Also building um, interfaces for, uh, like, for example, to allow a, a clinician to um, service somebody at home through an, a computer, a, a friendly computer system that would help you do that. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to come into a clinic or the hospital. Right, exactly. Awesome. So you zoomed in on glyphosate. Uh-huh. Yeah, once the... I heard that lecture, I basically really focused on glyphosate after that. Um, and I still am to this day. I mean, I'm still looking at the vaccines, and I still think the vaccines are important, but I... Uh, I've really zeroed in on the glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll we'll come to vaccines in a little bit here because I do want to talk about that too, and and other um, any other chemicals that you you know you feel are contributing to our our very uh, chronic diseased population. So glyphosate is the herbicide in Roundup. Mm -hmm. I go around and ask people if they've heard of glyphosate, and I can't. I'm really shocked how many people don't know anything about it. I know. That's that's really uh, disturbing. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, what I've found is that the majority of people feel or think that if they're eating non-GMO, they're safe. I know. That's really uh, a very important point to make, that non-GMO is not good enough. Many of the foods that are non-GMO actually have higher levels of glyphosate than the GMO ones. Right. Because right. they sprayed right before the harvest and it goes right into the seed, it gets right into the food. Very high levels are found in lentils and chickpeas and wheat and oats, for example, oatmeal and Cheerios. Mm -hmm. Very high levels. So you really have to go. You know, non GMO Cheerios, that's supposed to be heart healthy. It's just terrible food to purchase, you know? I know. So my under now tell me if I'm wrong. So my understanding is that, that the whole non GMO thing really relates to corn because corn has been modified to be able to mm -hmm. withstand being sprayed with Roundup or glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that if you're eating non-GMO corn, you might be okay, but mm -hmm. not like the other grains. I know sunflower seeds, I, I call, right. I, I was ordering uh, sunflower seed treats for my chickens and I had the uh, farm supply call the company because I wanted to find out if they were sprayed with glyphosate. And they said they all get mixed in together, but they estimated that probably 60% of them were, were sprayed. Right. I actually think the sunflower seeds are the reason for an epidemic and a bird beak problem around the Great Lakes. It showed up <gasps> um, oh. around the turn of the century. 
Um, the birds just have the, their beak just overgrows and twists around. They get to where they can't eat and then they die. Uh, it's uh -huh. an epidemic going on with the chickadees. The chickadees are very fond of, of the uh, bird feeders. You know, they're common right. birds yep. with the feeders. And the mm -hmm. feeders, people, people were feeding them sunflower seeds sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest. I suspect that that's the reason for that problem. But, you know, with they, I found papers, all kinds of papers. One paper covered all kinds of chemicals and me toxic metals, couldn't find anything didn't even look at glyphosate. I mean, it just really annoys me that no one thinks glyphosate could be the problem because it's supposed to be so so friendly, you know, so harmless. So they don't ever think of it, even though it's kind of the obvious thing that's staring you in the face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I remember in the 70s, my first organic garden, and I bought a, a spray bottle of Roundup because it said it was safe for organic gardens. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I, and <laughs> so luckily cute. I didn't use a lot of it, but, you know, just to spray on some of the weeds. Now, I, I, I can't believe it. I mean, yes. I thought I was doing something that was, you know, not going to be detrimental to my health or anyone else's. Yeah, it's often the case that they choose Roundup because it's the harmless, you know, it's the least toxic. They think it's the least toxic of the chemicals that, that are available for something. Uh, invasive weeds and waterways, for example, and I suspect the anencephaly epidemic in Yakima, Washington, there were a whole string of... Uh, Children born with uh, no no brain, basically their cerebral cortex was missing. Oh my goodness! Um, over a period of time, over a couple of two two couple of years, over a period where they were using high levels of glyphosate in the waterways to control an, an invasive weed, it correlates with the uh, you know with the use of of uh, glyphosate. Don Huber has talked about this, and he and I both believe that glyphosate was the cause of this epidemic. And again, they didn't look at glyphosate; they studied, they looked at all kinds of chemicals. Couldn't find a, a correlation and gave up, you know, but they didn't look at glyphosate, even though it was the obvious one to think of because it was the one they had increased tremendously over those two years. Well, why do you think they're not looking at glyphosate then if you're, you're thinking it's obvious? They're so convinced it's safe that they don't think it could possibly be the cause. I think that's what it is. They just are convinced it's safe. You know, people believe that so strongly that they never think of it. So how does it work? Give us the, the, so people can really understand. <laughs> I, doctor, I had Dr. Theory Brain on, and he did talk about the origins of glyphosate and how it was used to pull, uh, what, what is it, minerals mm -hmm. out of, yeah. uh, uh, out of uh, the, the... Clean pipes, for example. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, stripping the, the minerals out of the pipe. Yeah. Uh, lead, for example. But that was a while ago that I, I did that. And, and I'm sure you have, you know, your own take on explaining how glyphosate works and what it does. Yes. Um, well, the, the key thing that, it, uh, that they've identified as its most uh, obvious effect on the plants is that it disrupts a specific pathway in the plant, plants called the shikimate pathway. Mm -hmm. It's a biological pathway that human cells don't have. And this is the argument that's used to say, you know, it's really great because we don't have that pathway. Therefore, we cannot be affected by this chemical. That's the argument that's used. Right. Um, but that pathway does uh, exist in multiple species of microbes and in particular in very important beneficial species in our gut, like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. So when we eat glyphosate, those bacteria get harmed by it. As a consequence, pathogens get a chance to grow and we end up with a disrupted gut microbiome. So inflammatory gut, you know, and then uh, leaky gut, Crohn's disease, all these different issues that people are having, digestive issues with their bowels and whatnot, all these things are showing up in ep epidemic proportions right now because glyphosate is basically acting like an antibiotic and it's killing off preferentially the beneficial bacteria. So that's one big thing. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. the people are learning now, there's lots and lots of papers coming out uh, recently about the connection between the, the gut and the brain right? and how, how intimate you know, the, the uh, relationship there is between the gut microbes and the brain. And so it can cause uh, issues in the gut can cause issues in the brain. So how does that work? How does your gut's dysbiosis, how does that affect your brain? One thing is that those, to those toxic species can release toxic uh, metabolites, you know, that toxins basically that can go to the brain and damage the brain. Um, they also do signaling. They do signaling by, by the, via the vagus nerve. The, the gut, there's a communication between the gut and the brain along the nervous system and the mm -hmm. gut apparently those microbes can even penetrate the brain and infect it recently people are finding that the microbes that are normally inhabiting the gut are actually showing up in the brain this is very recent re research they, they had this uh 
notion that the brain would be free of microbes, but they're, but they're finding that that's not necessarily true and that they think then that's connected to disease also, infection in the brain of the microbes that are supposed to be living in the gut. And that's, again, the leaky gut, I think, is allowing things to, to move around to places they're not supposed to be in. Mm-hmm. Now, don't we have a blood-brain barrier that's supposed to keep, all yes. the, we'll say, bad stuff out? So what right. happens? How do, how do these microbes, how are they able to cross the blood-brain barrier? Right. I mean, there's actually, there's, um, it's not obvious to even the researchers right now exactly how those microbes are getting in. It could be through the lymph system and then into mm-hmm. the cerebral spinal fluid. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the barrier, the blood brain barrier could be leaky. And in fact, when the gut barrier becomes leaky, it actually sends signaling molecules into the blood that actually causes the brain barrier to become leaky as well. So you get a leaky brain barrier behind a leaky gut barrier. It follows after the mm-hmm. leaky gut barrier. Mm-hmm. And so then uh, toxins as well as um, the microbes themselves can then get into the brain. Got it. I was surprised to learn that the, uh, the the barrier in the gut is only one cell thick. Right. That is amazing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Those cells have a lot of responsibility. I mean, if you think about it, it just, it blew me away. I thought it was, I just thought it had a lot more oomph to it, you know, that maybe quarter inch thick or something like that. But just one cell is all that's keeping us from... Uh, from from these toxins getting you know into our 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 body, yeah. And Zach Bush is a, a friend of mine who he, he has this uh, Restore for Life that he promotes as a, to help treat glyphosate poisoning, mm-hmm. and he's done research um, on the gut, and he has shown that glyphosate causes um, the release of zonulin, which is a uh, a biological molecule that causes the gut barrier to open up, so it produces the leaky gut in response to the glyphosate. Oh, now I haven't heard that before. What was the name? Is zonulin? Zonulin, Z-O-N-U-L-I-N. Okay. Hmm. And and how does it work? Do you know? Do they know? Or yeah, well, I have some theories, but it, it relates to some <laughs> other properties of glyphosate. So we could get into that uh, later. Of course, and you mentioned okay. the metals. Chelating the metals is also important. Glyphosate binds very strongly. It's got a negative two charge, and it binds very binds very strongly to metals, particularly manganese and iron and zinc. You know, these are Cobalt, uh, copper, these are all, these are micronutrients that we need. We need them uh, critically for as catalysts for our enzymes uh, in very small amounts, but glyphosate makes them unavailable. So, and we also have mineral deficiencies in our food because of glyphosate, because uh, that's one thing Don Huber showed is that it prevents the uptake of these minerals into the plants. So we end up with a deficiency by eating plants that are exposed to glyphosate. And then uh, we don't get enough minerals in our diet, and then glyphosate grabs hold of the ones we have so that it becomes even more deficient. So we have a lot of mineral deficiency problems as a consequence of glyphosate. That's another feature. A third thing that I I talked about in the first paper I wrote on glyphosate was together with Anthony Samsel. After I came back from that meeting, he and I hooked up and and we started uh, working on a paper that was published a few months later. And we talked about three things. One was the disruption of the gut microbiome, Mm -hmm. you know, through this poisoning of the beneficial bacteria. Uh, two was the chelation of the metals to cause metal uh, deficiencies in those minerals. Mm-hmm. And three was that it has been shown in studies to disrupt the cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver. You can call them CYP enzymes for short. Mm-hmm. Uh, those enzymes are critical for many functions. One is to activate vitamin D, and we have an epidemic in vitamin D deficiency in our country t- today. Mm-hmm. Another mm-hmm. one is the bile acids. Uh, it's critical for producing the bile acids the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And another one is that the, it detoxes many toxic chemicals in the environment, including things that are produced by those uh, microbes, those, those toxic um, pathogens. Mm-hmm. So because the cyp enzymes are destroyed, and even other chemicals, other chemicals that are used in agriculture, for example, and drugs, things like um, Tylenol, various drugs are, are metabolized by these cyp enzymes. So when they're busted, everything else becomes much more toxic than it would otherwise be. Hmm. Well, I know. I think a lot of people don't realize the liver doesn't it have over four hundred different things that it does. <laughs> it's <not> Probably very... <laughs> the liver is amazing, and it really is just responsible for making sure that nothing gets past it. You know, things come from the gut into that hepatic portal vein, which goes carries things from the gut to the liver, and the liver basically grabs everything out that it thinks shouldn't be there. It tries mm-hmm. to clear it of all the toxic elements before it hits the general, general circulation. So it's a tremendous filter to try to protect the body from the toxins that are coming from the gut. 
And if the liver is not functioning well, then those toxins get throughout the circulation and cause all kinds of problems. The liver is definitely very sensitive to glyphosate. People, studies have shown, even in very small amounts, uh, in rat studies, for example, that the liver uh, is one of the first organs to get affected, and also the kidneys. We have an epidemic in kidney failure, and particularly there's a bunch of agricultural workers, for example, in Central America and in Sri Lanka. Who, uh, there's the uh, sugarcane workers in Central America who are dying in record numbers in their 40s, you know, young, uh, healthy farmers, you know, agricultural mm -hmm. workers are succumbing to uh, kidney disease to the point of kidney failure. Uh, and there, I think it's glyphosate is a major player in that problem. Mm -hmm. Wow. So is there any, uh, are there any areas or farms that you know of where they were using glyphosate, had issues like this and then stopped using it and that it changed? That would be a lovely story, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any specific examples like that. Um, of course, you know about the uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Do you know the story about the California lawsuit? I, um, I'm not sure I do. Please elucidate. Yeah, yeah, it's really important. So it's been clear for some time that agricultural workers have an increased risk to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And it's been suspected that, you know, various chemicals that they're exposed to are causal. Glyphosate has always kind of gotten off the hook because they always say, well, those other ones are more toxic. They're probably the reason because they're usually using other things besides glyphosate, you know, so it's very right. hard to sort it out. Mm -hmm. But it turns out there are many people who who got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where glyphosate was the only chemical they were using. And this particular lawsuit was one of those people. His name is Dwayne Johnson. He was a, uh, he, actually it's really disturbing because his job was to use glyphosate in the schoolyards Ooh. of California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he used only glyphosate. He didn't use any other chemicals. And he had a sort of malfunctioning unit. So he sometimes, a couple of times he had some spills. So he was actually getting physical contact on the skin and he developed a really nasty rash. Um, so it's sort of logical that the glyphosate on his skin was causing the rash, and then he developed the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is associated with, you know, the skin rash is certainly a, you know, lesions on the skin skin are a common feature of non-Hodgkin's mm -hmm. lymphoma. And um, and he was very young; he was like 42, I think, when he was diagnosed. He had young children. It was just a total tearjerker, really, mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a California um, case with a jury, and the. Um, and I was watching it, and I was not very hopeful because I figured Monsanto lawyers have, always have a way of somehow weaseling out of it. But, but it actually worked. I mean, the, the jury awarded him, I think it was $289 million in damages. Oh, my goodness. Including punitive damages because of just like the tobacco industry that Monsanto had withheld information and had secret. You know, they got, they got some documents from Monsanto that showed that they were being, that they were being corrupt in the way that they were. And giving disinformation about glyphosate to pretend that it was safe when in fact they had strong suspicions themselves that it was carcinogenic, you know, so mm -hmm. it, um, it was fantastic. It, it got reduced by the judge to a smaller amount, I think 78 million, like a couple, a month later or something. But luckily the judge still uh, agreed with the verdict. So the verdict did not go away, but the amount uh, was reduced to 78 million. And mm -hmm. now Monsanto, of course, is going to probably appeal it to a higher court. So the story is not over yet, but there are now over 8,000 cases behind this one, all claiming that, mon that glyphosate caused their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I think it could go the way of the cigarette industry with so many lawsuits that they just um, cave, you know, I'm hoping mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it could be the beginning of the end for glyphosate, I believe. Well, that would be wonderful. However, if it's already in the soil, um, is there any way, what's it, what's the half-life or does, is right. there anything to get it out of the soil and get right. rid of it? Um, that, that's all really good questions. And <laughs> I don't know that we have all the answers there, but mm -hmm. uh, Monsanto had claimed that it uh, is very bio, you know, it, it biodegrades really quickly. And within a couple of weeks, it's gone. And it's, you know, that and another reason why it's a great chemical to use. Mm -hmm. um, that turns out not to be true. People have found and, and it, it depends on the soil type, it depends on the microbes in the soil, there are not many microbes that can metabolize glyphosate. So if they're not in the soil, it's going to last a lot longer. Um, the sun can help to break it down. But if it's rainy, you know, I mean, so this the soil type can matter. So some certain types of soil, uh, it, it sticks around, it gets bound up with the soil and it doesn't degrade. And so it can actually stay for years in certain so soil types. A study on the on marine study showed that it lasted for um, for a year uh, in, in seawater. 
Mm. You know, so mm-hmm. that's disturbing because it can really stick around a long time if it gets into the waterways, for example. Oh, geez. So you mentioned microbes that can, uh, what did you say? I, I eat it or, or? Oh, break it down. Yes, yeah. that's a good one. I should share this one with, the, with your audience because it's important. Acetobacter. Acetobacter are among the very few microbes that can break the CP bond. Glyphosate has an unusual CP bond, it's called. And most microbes don't know what to do with that. But acetobacter can break that bond. They can use glyphosate as a source of phosphorus. And um, they are present in, uh, in fermented foods like uh, apple cider vinegar and sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha. All those things are, would be really good, I believe, to, to eat on a regular basis as a way to help break down the glyphosate in your body. Wow. Now that is the first time I've heard that. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, that's really important news. And we, we make a habit of eating a lot of vinegar in our in our diet. Mm-hmm. I used to do like a teaspoon of cider vinegar, you know, in warm water. I just may go back to that. Although I do do my best to eat organic as much as I can. But sometimes... Yes, we do too, of course. We, it, we only buy organic when we shop at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people can't. A lot of people don't they don't have access where they right. live to, or, order or maybe it, it's know. too expensive. I mean, for it some is people, costly, it's unfortunately. And I think the price, I mean, I hope the price will go down. I think that's one of the important things that needs to be done right now is for farmers to figure out how to do organic more uh, cheaply, you know, mm-hmm. and part of it is the, su- the subsidies. The government is subsidizing the toxic food, which is, which is making it unfair. That food is un. Uh, unreasonably cheap because the government is subsidizing it, which is so ridiculous. If they would subsidize the organic, they could give them a, a better advantage, and the cost differential might not be bad enough that more and more people would feel they could afford it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. The government should be making a major effort to move back towards organic, small organic farms. I think that's the answer mm-hmm. to our problems, and the government is not doing anything to change uh, the way we grow food, unfortunately. Not yet. Mm-hmm. So perhaps for those who are listening who are concerned and this is important to them, uh, perhaps writing or calling their their congressman or senator or. Yes, you have a fantastic person, by the way, up there in Canada. Tony Mitra is his name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a Canadian born person, but he's a Canadian. He's a uh, India, India. He's from India, but he's a Canadian citizen. Mm-hmm. And he's in India right now. And he's he's just a wonderful man. He has been so devoted to bringing pub- awareness to glyphosate to the Canadian government. And he's been doing this for many, many years. He finally succeeded in getting Canada's government to test over 8,000 different food t- uh, foods for glyphosate contamination. And mm-hmm. they gave him all that data. And he published a book called Poison Foods of North America. And okay. um, and what was his name again? Tony Mitra, T O N Y M I T R A. He's really great. He's in he's in um, India right now, and he's giving talks in front of large crowds. He's he's really gaining a lot of popularity there, and even the government. He's visiting the uh, governmental representatives of, of the counties and things like that, and he's particularly focusing on Canadian lentils that have been imported. The, apparently, India imports a lot of lentils and chickpeas from Canada, mm. and they are loaded with glyphosate. They were among the highest. Uh, you know, levels tested uh, in those 8,000 foods. The highest levels were coming out in certain samples of of um, chickpeas, garbanzo beans, and lentils. Mm-hmm. And um, and then Canada sells these lentils to India. And he was trying to get the Indian government to be aware that they need to they need to test the food for glyphosate at the border. And they need to turn it back, you know, because the levels are too high. The government is becoming quite alarmed and quite aware in India. Mm-hmm. The, the thing was interesting is that Canada tested imports from Europe, imports from Mexico, from the U.S., and then, of course, Canadian foods. And they consistently found the highest levels of glyphosate in foods from the United States and Canada. Mexico was more on par with Europe in terms of the levels that were found in the Mexican foods. They were much lower Mm -hmm. than the uh, United States and Canada. Well, my understanding is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the farther north you go, the more likely it's going to be used because it's in areas, especially where it's wetter, mm-hmm. where the growing season is shorter, mm-hmm. um, because when they spray it before harvest, it, yes. it dries it faster so they can get a better harvest. Absolutely. And in fact, sometimes you're rushing against a frost. Mm-hmm. So you can make it uh, go to seed faster, earlier and beat the frost. And that becomes very important, for example, in the winter wheat in Canada. Mm-hmm. Got it. Wow. 
Oh, goodness. <laughs> <It's> really, <laughs> I try not to be depressed by all of this. Um, hopefully you can give us a little ray of sunshine somewhere along the way. <laughs> um, <I'll try. laughs> so, so autism is the, uh, is what brought you to this. Yeah. To, uh -huh. to, so how does glyphosate lead to autism? What, what happens in the yeah, body? Well it certainly starts with the gut and many of the autistic kids have a lot of gut issues. And uh, one of the things is that lactobacillus is especially sensitive to glyphosate because they lactobacillus uses a lot of manganese. It's very, mm. and manganese is very important to that species and glyphosate makes manganese unavailable to it. And this is causing it to, uh, to them not to thrive. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to sort of gain a foothold in the gut and then they'll chase away the, the pathogens because they'll, they'll be there but that doesn't happen and the pathogens start growing and you get things like a clostridia overgrowth. Many of the autistic kids have tested high for clostridia mm -hmm. and clostridia species can release these toxins that I was telling you about. Some of the, there was a study done by um, Christopher Shaw was his name, I believe. William Shaw, <laughs> William mm -hmm. Shaw uh, did a study on triplets. So the, there were two boys and a girl. The boys both had autism. The girl had a seizure disorder. All three of them tested high for glyphosate levels in their urine all three of them had clostridia overgrowth in their gut, and he was hypothesizing, uh, the, the author was hypothesizing that what was happening was that uh, toxins released by the clostridia were interfering with the metabolism of dopamine, and dopamine uh, would become toxic in the brain because it wouldn't be cleared. So you'd, dopamine is a neurotransmitter, mm -hmm. and it would mm -hmm. overexcite the brain and cause uh, neuronal burnout. So that's quite an interesting theory that he had about how you could get to uh, autism through that path. So that's just one possibility. The manganese is interesting because I did a whole paper with Anthony Sampson. We did us. We've done six papers together so far, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a paper on manganese, glyphosate, and manganese. Just that one mineral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting because what we found is that uh, manganese is normally distributed to the body from the liver via the bile acids. It binds to the bile acids and then it gets carried into the blood mm -hmm. and okay. and distributed. But the uh, Glyphosate disrupts the flow of the bile acids, which is going to cause the manganese to build up in the liver and become toxic. And manganese has a very interesting property that it can easily travel along nerve fibers. So it looks like the manganese is going along the vagus nerve up to the brain stem and becoming high concentrations in the brain stem, uh, which can then cause damage to the, to the nuclei there. And for example, the pineal gland, which can cause then sleep disorder. Sleep disorder is another thing that's an epidemic in our country today, so many people mm -hmm. have issues with sleep, and this could be one of the ways by which glyphosate is causing that. Um, and then meanwhile, there's manganese deficiency throughout the body, which has issues with respect to glutamate toxicity. So it's another neurotransmitter that can become toxic because the enzyme that converts glutamate to glutamine depends on manganese. There's another species in the gut that produces an enzyme that breaks down oxalate, and there's oxalate in the food, but your body can also produce oxalate. If the, if the microbe that breaks it down is it can't do it, the oxalate builds up. And when oxalate builds up, it causes the kidneys to flush sulfate. And you get a sulfate deficiency problem, which is seen in autistic kids. They have a sulfate deficiency problem. They also have excess oxalate. And oxalate can crystal out into crystals and you know, cause things like kidney stones, but also can crystallize out in the brain to cause damage to the brain. So that's just another possibility. Mm-hmm. There's like many, many different things. These are just a few of the things that come off the top of my head. Wow. Those are some examples. There's also methionine. Uh, glyphosate disrupts the synthesis of methionine by the gut microbes, and it disrupts the synthesis of the aromatic amino acids, which are the uh, product of the shikimate pathway. And the mm -hmm. aromatic amino acids are precursors to things like serotonin and melatonin. That's, again, the sleep disorder problem. Melanin, the skin tanning aging, which can then cause you to be sensitive to skin cancer, and thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone deficiency in the mom, for example, is, gives you a fourfold increased risk to autism. And um, a folate, and so folate is the B vitamin that's related to the methylation pathways. Uh, autistic kids have methylation disturbances. Mm -hmm. Part of that could be the folate deficiency, but also the methionine, because the gut microbes can synthesize methionine from inorganic sulfur, and that pathway also gets disrupted by glyphosate. So you get those deficiencies in those amino acids that cause a lot of uh, issues with various metabolic pathways and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, lactobacillus and bifida strains of mm -hmm. probiotics. And recently, 
I, I can't remember where I read it or heard, but that by taking those orally, it doesn't really do much. Do you... I know. I've been hearing that too. They basically die in the stomach, right? Yeah. So what yeah, do you do? Can't really get them through. So I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really believe in taking probiotics as a, as a pill. Mm -hmm. I do believe in eating probiotic foods again, mm -hmm. because they can metabolize the glyphosate, which is super, even for example, in the oral cavity, they can do it in the, uh, in the mouth, you know, they can get started right away in the mouth, mm -hmm. uh, metabolizing the glyphosate, as I mentioned before, the acetobacter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm really on the fence about probiotics. With, I'd like to know how they're working for people, whether people are finding that they're being helpful for them in terms of their gut issues, because it is a question of whether they can get past the, the stomach, because it's very acidic, and most of them would die, I would think, before they would get to where they need to go. So you're thinking in terms of going the other direction, right? <laughs> Fecal transplants, which have been really quite remarkable. Yes, I've been hearing yes. about that. Particularly with C. diff, you know. So, so mm -hmm. Clostridium difficile is another infection that's become a really big problem in the um, in the hospitals, you know, mm -hmm. sort mm -hmm. of uh, multiple antibiotic resistance C. difficile. They are also a species that is, um, I think they're only resistant to glyphosate, not necessarily able to metabolize it. There's a, another one, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is another mm -hmm. big problem in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. That's a species that can metabolize glyphosate. So those Pseudomonas and Salmonella and um, Acetobacter are the only three I know of that can metabolize glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, with the lactobacillus and the bifida strains, if you ingest them in food, do, does that make a difference than just taking a capsule? Or? <laughs> it seems like it would still get killed in the... In yeah. The, yeah. That's I mean, I obviously, thinking. there is some way in which they colonize. So it's not, they must be some that get by, right? Because otherwise, you would have a sterile gut if everything got killed in the stomach. So there must right. be, some, there are some uh, acid um, loving microbes, like what's the one, uh, pylori, uh, H. pylori, which mm, is mm -hmm, one that's associated mm -hmm. with uh, uh, stomach uh, ulcers. Right. That's, that one can handle a lot of acid. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's a mm. research question to know, mm -hmm. uh, to wonder about that how to fix the problem. Right, because I, I think a lot of people are spending mo a lot of money on probiotics. And... Yes, I think you're right. And I've been wondering whether it's been doing any good. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you must have experience. Do you have experience with uh, people that you know and stuff? Because you're in a medical field. Well, I haven't practiced as a nurse in a long time, but I did, I had, you know, I should get retested, but I did, uh, it was a Genova diagnostics test. Because uh -huh. I was having no energy and brain fog and, you know, getting more and more depressed. And I had weight, let's see, I had way too much lactobacillus strains. I had uh -huh. no, no bifida and the, the strep strains were okay. Those were fine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I went on this whole program with a functional medicine doctor to correct that. But I, I never got retested, but my and I've been doing other things too. But yeah, it's always I, hard I, to know, isn't it? Because you're always trying all kinds of things at the same time, so it's not clear which one did the trick. Exactly. And some people yeah. say, will say, well, don't you want to do just one at a time? And I'm like, no, I want to feel better. <laughs> I don't, I don't really... have the patience for that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't really care, you know. So I haven't had any brain fog in a long time, and my energy is, like is you've coming back. Diet, right? Mostly. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't worry about it as much as I used to because of this true wisdom, true immunity protocol that, that we did, which I can tell you about later. I, I have talked about it a little bit on the program, but it's a way to turn the, the mechanism in the brain that controls your immune system and get your immune functions actually working properly and optimized mm. so that your body can handle a lot more than mm -hmm. it it could before. That sounds great. And that's certainly very, very important. That's one of the reasons. I mean, I'm always big on sulfur, and I really believe that sulfur is essential for a healthy immune system mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. we have a sulfur deficiency uh, epidemic in this country, uh, particularly mm -hmm. sulfate, which is a mod you know, sulfur plus oxygen <clears throat> plus negative charge, SO4 minus 2. Mm -hmm. That's a really important molecule in the body, and I believe it's important for maintaining the electrical circuit of the body. And so when your electrical circuit becomes deficient, a lot of things go bad. And one of the things is that the uh, macrophages have a hard time clearing the microbes. So you end up with a lot of uh, a poor immune system mm -hmm. because of a lack of sufficient sulfate, which 
is a consequence of lack of sufficient sulfur, but also of a messed up sulfur system by glyphosate. So with the sulfate, how, what do you recommend? Are, are there foods or? And, uh, I would say just eat sulfur containing foods. I think um, garlic and onions are fantastic. Cruciferous vegetables, also um, seafood and uh, fish. And generally, um, animal based animal based foods have a lot of healthy sulfur containing amino acids. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Well, and garlic. I mean, my theory is that all savory foods should contain some garlic, and I love garlic. And, and all and all awesome. sweets should have chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, chocolate is also good, by the way. And, and those kinds of um, polyphenols and flavonoids that are contained in a lot of these, like chocolate and tea and co- and uh, coffee, and also in the colorful fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, and spices, you know, spices like curcumin and turmeric, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, and even resveratrol, which is in wine, wine. Right. Um, mm-hmm. these things are all really useful, I believe, for transporting sulfate. Mm-hmm. They transport sulfate. It's a theory of mine. I mean, they are sulfated when they're when they're in circulation, but they're actually carrying sulfate from point A to point B and delivering it to some point in the body. Got it. Hmm. So what other things besides autism do you feel are a, a result of all of this usage of glyphosate? It's a long list. Um, Alzheimer's <laughs> is an epidemic in the, in the adults, and it's got a very similar pattern as autism. By the way, both of them are going up exactly in step with the increase in the use of glyphosate on core crops. And mm-hmm. um, so Alzheimer's, um, also uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, thyroid mm-hmm. cancer, bladder cancer, liver disease and kidney disease I talked about earlier, all these mm-hmm. gut problems, um, and celiac disease, all the um, food allergies, you know, the peanut allergy, the uh, gluten intolerance and casein intolerance, all of those food allergies, I believe they're due to glyphosate. And I can explain why, by the way, there's a very interesting uh, theory that I have about how glyphosate works, which which affects much, much more than just the shikimate pathway. Because the shikimate pathway is a very good example of that theory, because the way it breaks the shikimate pathway makes a lot of sense if you assume that this is happening. My theory, which is that glyphosate is substituting for the amino acid glycine, during protein synthesis. So proteins are synthesized as beads on a string from these amino acids. There's about 20 of these amino acids according to the DNA code. And Mm -hmm. uh, a code for glycine has is a GGX, which means it has to be two um, guanines and then it it can be anything. And the third one, so it's a three letter code. Okay. So GGA, GGC, GGG, and GGT, those are the four letters of the uh, DNA, you know, you know about Mm -hmm. this code. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when the machinery sees a code for glycine, it grabs glyphosate by mistake and it sticks it into the protein. This is what I think is happening, oh. which is really, really wild because it has enormous consequences everywhere. Mm-hmm. And once I figured this out and started to look at the diseases um, that were going up in step with glyphosate and looking at the underlying issues with those diseases, the various you know molecules, proteins that were affecting those diseases, you, it was amazing how clear it was to me that this glyphosate substitution could explain those diseases. I've written uh, papers about, for example, ALS. ALS, is, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, mm-hmm. is a beautiful example of um, glycine dependencies in the proteins that are, um, uh, whether you have a genetic um, mutation mm-hmm. uh, in a protein that causes you to have a familiar form of ALS so that you have a genetic form rather than a sort of idiopathic form. Okay. Those people who have a a gene, you know, that gives them a, a risk factor for ALS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Many of those mutations are glycine mutations. Getting rid of the glycine, replacing it with something else causes the disease. So in the case of glyphosate, it goes in and it replaces some of the proteins, but not all of them. So just some of them. So it causes less. It's not as severe as having a genetic mutation, but it has the same effect, only milder. But it has it over all the proteins of the body. So it's really, really a distributed uh, disease mechanism that has so many complex um, consequences that you can't figure it out. This is why it can be associated with so many diseases because all of them can be traced to, many of those diseases can be traced to specific glycines in specific proteins that are crucial for those proteins to work correctly. It's really, really fascinating. So wow. I've learned a whole lot about glycine and glycine's role in proteins. And um, you start to get a very clear picture. I could show, for example, ALS is, I mean, not ALS, but Alzheimer's is very interesting because amyloid beta plaque is a, mm-hmm. is a, associated with Alzheimer's. It's this protein that precipitates out and causes this plaque. 
normally that protein goes uh, through the membrane, through the membrane of the cell, and it forms a structure called an alpha helix to do that. Okay. And the alpha helix is, is uh, stabilized by glycine residues. It has a very interesting, it's called GXXX, 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 G sequence. So it's four <laughs> glycines, you know, four glycines with wild cards in between, but equally spaced, you mm-hmm. know? Okay. And that sequence in uh, amyloid beta is very uh, important for it to, to make its alpha helix. So if you start mucking around with those glycines and turn them into glyphosate, the helix won't form. And instead, it forms a beta sheet which becomes a soluble protein in the cytoplasm. And the beta sheets then, if enough of them form, they start to precipitate out as these fibrils. In other words, glyphosate substituting for those glycines could easily explain the misfolding of the amyloid beta to cause the Alzheimer's. And in fact, they've zeroed in on those glycines as being the problematic piece of amyloid beta that's causing trouble, but they don't understand why they're causing trouble because it's been those same glycines for millions of years. And they didn't cause trouble in the past. That's because there was no glyphosate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. I I actually hadn't considered the breadth. I'd gotten the depth of the problem with glyphosate, mm-hmm. but not the breadth of all of the illnesses, challenges, diseases, whatever you want to call it all, right. that are affected. It's amazing. Yeah, and I have only given a partial list. There's still a lot more. It's amazing how many diseases are going up dramatically. Even mm-hmm. something like keratoconus, which is a disease of the eye that sort of causes um, astigmatism. Eventually, you have to get a, a new cornea. Like you can get a corneal transplant because of this uh, keratoconus. That's also going up dramatically. And I think it's because of glyphosate. You know, and I can explain the process. I'm working on a paper on that right now. And wow. of course, the kidney failure among those uh, among those workers. Mm-hmm. I can explain it as synergistic talk. The workers in sugarcane fields where they spray sugarcane right before the harvest, mm-hmm. and those workers are getting very sick with kidney failure. And they have special issues with respect to their work environment. You know, it's working uh, high heat conditions, mm-hmm. uh, hard labor, getting dehydrated. And the, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, protein that pumps the water out of the urine to bring it back into the body could get busted by glyphosate so it couldn't work. And that would cause a lot of loss of water through the urine, which would then cause dehydration to be much worse. So it's things like that. You can find how you know, certain proteins would be affected in, con- in, in conjunction with other things that are going on to cause a special harm. Right, right. And so they drink a lot of water, and the water they're drinking is probably contaminated with glyphosate as well. So mm-hmm. they're just kind of getting poison in their water, mm-hmm. and it's going to their kidneys, and then it's just wiping out their ability to retain the water. And so then they can't really, uh, they can't fight the dehydration. Wow. So if they were to, or anyone, okay, let let's say uh, someone is listening to this, and they're like, "Oh my God, I have to, I have to change my diet. I have to, I have to change things." What can you do then to get the glyphosate out of the body? Yeah, well, of course, the first thing is to stop bringing it in. So that right. means eating organic. And I really recommend to anybody listening that you really should seriously consider buying organic. And one thing you could do is buy Tony Mitra's book and find out which foods have high levels and make sure to buy those organic. If you can't buy everything organic, at least pick the ones that are most likely to be contaminated and switch to organic for those foods, right. like the oatmeal, for example. And um, two is, uh, well, they've done some studies on animals. There's some papers published on studies on chickens and on um, cows. There were some cows. There was a nice study on cows where the cows were very sick. They they tested their urine. They found they had high levels of glyphosate, which is not surprising because they have a heavy dose of GMO Roundup Ready feed as part of their core diet. And um, they gave them uh, bentonite clay, interestingly, Mm -hmm. sauerkraut juice, which is going to be that... uh, microbe that I told you about, the acetobacter, right. sauerkraut juice, bentonite clay, and then fulvic acid and humic acid, which are organic matter from the soil. Mm-hmm. They gave them those uh, those nutrients and, uh, and and showed improvement and showed also tested their glyphosate later and the levels were down. So um, it's kind of encouraging, I think. So I think those things are all things people can take too, which is nice mm-hmm. uh, to help to uh, to remove the, the The theory was that these things, these uh, organic matter were binding to the glyphosate and taking it out through the feces is what they were hoping was happening. I don't think there's been proof of exactly how these things work. Now, of course, when glyphosate gets integrated into your proteins, if that's happening, um, much, much more difficult to get it out, particularly if you have a sulfur deficiency problem, because that disrupts not only the macrophages' ability to kill the microbes, but also the, their ability to clear the cellular debris. 
They mm, need sulfate okay. to do that. And so when sulfate is deficient, it's harder to clear busted proteins. So you're creating more busted proteins because of the glyphosate, proteins that misfold. Mm-hmm. Normally, your mm-hmm. body would just um, break them down and make them again if that happens. The cell would just recognize that this protein is a mistake. You know, it, was, it didn't come out right. Okay. Uh, sort of a reject off the assembly line, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they actually do that. I mean, it's interesting. The proteins are made in rather a sloppy way. Lots of mistakes are made. But when you make mistakes with glyphosate substituting for glycine, it's a very serious mistake. And it can, depending upon where that glycine residue is, it could really, really mess up the function of that protein. But then if you can't clear it because you don't have enough sulfate, um, it'll stick around and cause trouble, such as Alzheimer's, but also things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is also an epidemic mm-hmm. today. And of course, we have an epidemic in joint pain and, and um, bone pain, you know, all these back pain, mm-hmm. uh, opioid drug over, over, overdose due to so much pain that you can't handle right. uh, people dying, all of that. I think that's due to glyphosate because the collagen... Um, is the collagen is the mo- is the most common protein in the body? Something like twenty five percent of the proteins in the body are collagen molecules. They make up the the joints, the skin, the bone. I mean, all the connective tissue of the body. Lots and lots of collagen in there. Mm-hmm. Collagen has tons of glycine in it. There's a whole stretch of collagen that has glycine as every third residue. So one third of the of the amino acids in that chain are glycine residues. Tremendous opportunity for glyphosate to mess it up, and that those glycines are essential for performing, for creating the triple helix structure that collagen forms, which is important for it to have its tensile strength and its elasticity and its ability to hold water. So all of that's going to get messed up by the glyphosate substituting randomly for various Mm -hmm. uh, glycines in collagen. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. going to cause the joint to not be well cushioned. You know, it's going to cause bone on bone rubbing and that sort of thing. It's going to cause a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Sulfate. Do fermented foods have sulfate? Um, <laughs> they they probably have sulfur. I mean, depending upon which foods you're fermenting, but certainly cabbage has a lot of sulfur, actually. So it's a, I, I think um, fermented cabbage, like coleslaw, is really, really, you know, a, a fermented cabbage, I guess, becomes sauerkraut, right? right. <laughs> yeah. yep. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sauerkraut is really a very good food to eat mm-hmm. because it has, the, and cabbage itself, even unfermented, is good. I like to use make coleslaw with vinegar. Just put some apple cider vinegar in there, and you've got that um, acetobacter ready to go. And the cauliflower, I mean, the cauliflower. That cauliflower is another one. That's why I made a slip there. But uh, the cabbage uh, can provide a very good source of sulfur that can become sulfate. It's not you can't necessarily you can't really take a lot of sulfate just to take it as a as a you know like for example Epsom salts. Epsom salts I recommend by the way as a, as a bath. Mm-hmm. soaking in Epsom salts. Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. Right. And that sulfate will absorb through the skin and help to supply your body with sulfate. I really recommend that, and I do that myself. Um, but eating sulfate is a little tricky because it can cause diarrhea. It, sulfate is difficult for the blood to transport by itself. It needs to be, as I said, it has these carrier molecules. Mm-hmm. So eating foods that, that have carrier molecules, so that's like the curcumin, the spices, herbs and spices often have um, these molecules that can help to transport the sulfate. And also cholesterol can transport sulfate. So I like to eat foods that are high in cholesterol, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too, yeah. actually. Good, good. <laughs> I, I've never been a fan of this low fat thing. I've always oh, thought I'm it was so totally ridiculous. I, I haven't either. I ate butter all my life and I always believed in a, in a high fat diet, particularly healthy um, saturated fats, which... Uh, right. Yeah, good. Right. Yeah. Do you remember? Okay. Do you remember when margarine was the thing? Oh, I know. I never. I knew. Really no, I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't either. Two people on the floor, I know. Right? I thought it was totally crazy. And then I, we, you and I, were finally vindicated on that one. I know. But it, it just felt never felt good, right. But... Never felt right to me. Yeah, I agree with you totally. Yeah. Yep. Good, healthy fats. And then you find these foods, especially processed foods that are, you know, no fat or low fat. Well, what do they have a lot of? Sugar. Yeah, they're terrible. I mean, look at the soy protein bars. Don't eat soy protein bars. I mean, I think they're disgusting, especially, of course, if you're not organic. (laughs) Huge list of of chemicals in them, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like Mm -hmm. fake food. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Just, so whole uh, foods, so it's important to eat whole foods. Actually, uh, soup is a really good idea. Bone broth, uh, organic bone broth. Uh, that's another thing. My husband is the cook in our family, and he makes a pot of soup every week with um, bone, chicken bones and uh, beef bones. And um, you can uh, throw in some veggies and stuff, and it's just uh, really, really nourishing because you're getting a lot of minerals and also 
you're getting um, amino acids coming out of the, um, you know, you're getting a healthy source of nutrients in the bone broth uh, to help keep you um, nourished. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I've become a big Instant Pot fan. So when I roast a a chicken, organic chicken, um, I save all the bones and I just save everything and throw it in the Instant Pot with some onions and celery and and, uh, uh, what's the other thing? Carrots and um, bay leaf. And um, it doesn't take, it only takes like I think I usually do it for about an hour and a half. Um, it doesn't take long in the Instant Pot. And then oh, you've got, nice. then I freeze it and I use that for my chicken stock. Yes, right. Perfect. Yes. We, we do that too. We, we freeze uh, bowls of um, beef broth and, you know, the, the soups that we or he makes on the weekends. We mm-hmm. Just, uh, mm-hmm. Now with, with beef bones, it helps to roast those first. You get mm. more. You get more out of it if you roast them oh, first. That's a very interesting tip. We don't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. that was, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Fun. Oh, yeah. and the other thing that needs to be added when you're making bone broth is a little cider vinegar. That yes. helps. Yes, we know yep. that. Yep. Yes. Yep. Right. Great. That's great. Yeah. So that, I really believe in. Um, and I, I think eggs are also a really good um, source of uh, nutrients. Eggs are very nutrient rich. Absolutely. Food. Uh, and of course, organic. You get the highest quality eggs you can find. I believe it's worth the extra money. Yeah, my chickens aren't laying very well right now, and and my friends who normally buy eggs for me are so bummed because everybody always says that my eggs taste the best. Uh, you are not you've mine. Got to my out. chickens' <laughs> eggs. Well, I kind of pamper them. Like now that they can't get much in the way of greenery outside, we don't have mm-hmm. snowfall yet, but we will soon. Um, I start making sprouts for them. Mm. And, you know, I just, I try to make sure that their nutrition is, is up and, you know, they've got a few acres to run around on and uh, they you are know. really lucky chickens. <laughs> yes, they, they are. Good life they have. <laughs> I know, I know. So, yeah. So they, the eggs just taste different, you know, Absolutely. they just, they really that's do. And they that's really about do. the healthiest thing you could probably eat is the eggs from those chickens, mm-hmm. your chickens. Yeah. Right. That's great. Right. So for people, yeah, eat eggs and make sure, you know, this whole sometimes free range doesn't, excuse me, it doesn't mean shit. I know. Um, it's you, really, that's why I say the highest quality you can find because it's not yeah. good enough to just say, you know, uncaged or something like that. <laughs> right. It might just right. mean that there's a, a gate somewhere, you know, that they can. Yeah. Or, <laughs> right. Or, yeah, it just, it's kind of like, oh, it means they can flap their wings and that's about it. Yeah. Um, so if you know anyone, if you can get any source of, of somebody who has some chickens, and usually those of us who have chickens have extra eggs, selling them just helps to cover the feed costs. Get your eggs from, from somebody local. Yes. Um, and then for adding for, if you haven't added any fermented foods into your diet, just add right. some, it doesn't have yes. to be a lot, but adding some fermented foods in yeah. and then, oh, I'm having a thing. What was the other thing? Maybe the fats that uh, eating. The oh, right. Fats, right. Fats. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Healthy fats, healthy fats, yes. which would include mm-hmm. avocado, coconut oil, butter, olive oil. Mm, I liked sunflower seed oil too. Um, yes. Those are all great. Mm-hmm. Any other any other healthy fats that I haven't well, mentioned? Well, we use lard, actually. We use organic mm-hmm. lard for, mm-hmm. for cooking. You want to make sure that's organic, though. Mm-hmm. Organic mm-hmm. lard, which is not easy to find, but you can actually buy it on the web, which is how we get it. Oh, okay. And does that have a high uh, temperature? Uh, yes, you know it the... has a very high melting point, which is important for cooking, yes. Right. Okay. Okay. And what else? What else can people do? Mm. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Sunlight. Get out sun. in the sun. And that may be hard where you live because I think you get a lot of rain and you're up north. But, uh, <laughs> sunlight is really, really important. And I'm, I'm a worshiper. What do you think about full spectrum lights yeah, in, I, in the I, winter? It might be good. I mean, I, I don't have personal experience because I'm really good at getting sunlight. But I mm-hmm. think if I weren't, I would probably think of using them. Full spectrum mm-hmm. in particular. You really need the full spectrum. Right. And my research has shown that um, you need infrared, you need blue light, you need the you know, red, of course, red, infrared, blue, uh, and also UV. All of those um, have important roles, different roles in the body. Mm-hmm. It's really fascinating uh, how the sunlight works with the body, too. I think we can uh, use the sunlight as a source of energy. I do, uh, too. For our body, which is mm-hmm. fantastic. And so that can also help to beef, uh, beef up the sulfate. I believe that we 
uh, can make sulfate in response to sunlight. And I've got papers written about how that works, but it's really fascinating. So oh, it's fascinating biology. But sunlight can help you beef up your sulfate supplies. Awesome. Now, does the full spectrum light have all of that in it? I think it would. If it's full spectrum, that would be essentially like sunlight. Okay. You know? Okay. So that would be perfect. Okay. Cool. You do such fascinating work. It must be fun being you. <laughs> <laughs> I love the science. I just, I'm totally obsessed with it. I just have so much fun when I get a new paper that looks interesting and I just can't wait to read it. I'm like a kid in a candy store. It's so funny because most people are like, it. their eyes glaze over, but I just love it. It's so, so interesting, like a giant puzzle, you know? Right. And I want to understand all of it. And I, I certainly don't. I mean, I've got lots of gaps, but I'm getting there. Wow. It's so exciting that you're excited. It really is. Um, you know, you've obviously been a scientist for a while, and it's exciting that you're you're still. It still thrills you and and motivates you, and it's still your passion. Yes, absolutely. I I really am fortunate that I get paid to do it too. That's no my... kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody who gets paid to do what they love is yes, is fortunate. Really, really, really. I mean, that's what you should do to be happy. You should make sure you get a job that you love. So that... Yeah. Your work is play. Right, awesome. right. I love doing this, but I don't get paid. So, <laughs> Although I did, oh, I'm going to put a plug in. I did just learn how um, to put a support button on the website. So if anybody wanted to contribute $5, whatever, you know, just <laughs> just to help cover my costs and yeah. and because uh, I do everything myself, but, you know, I... I don't sell anything, and right. um, and I do this because I love doing it. I want to support people like you who are doing such wonderful work and are so brilliant, and I want to get this information out to people. I, I appreciate what you're doing because I think it's really great. that I love these podcasts. It's such a great opportunity to help to give people the message that they need to try to mm -hmm. be healthy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, it's be in wrapping up, is there anything you would like to leave the listeners with? Any Mm -hmm. Well, Piece I think organic is growing exponentially in step with the organic, uh, with the rise in glyphosate usage. You know, it's um, we're getting a tremendous increase in the demand for organic food in this country, in the United States, I think also in Canada, which I think is really good news that people are catching on. So hopefully, eventually, enough people will be eating organic or switching to organic and finding out that they feel better, telling their friends, telling their family. Maybe there'll be a real wave because I think we need to, we really need to do a massive overhaul of the, of the whole agricultural system. You know, it's not just the glyphosate, of course, it's the whole principle of poisoning the food in order to, um, to fight the weeds and the bugs. It's just a stupid way to grow food. And we need to recognize and acknowledge that and we need to change. And hopefully we can change fast, you know, with, especially with consumer pressure because consumer pressure really carries a lot of weight. So I think, um, there's hope in that respect that more and more people are switching to organic and finding that they're getting healthy. There's, by the way, there's a great movie out uh, recently called Secret Ingredients, mm. and Jeffrey Smith and Mary Hart mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. were the producers. Uh, I highly recommend it, and it's really about uh, a family of four who all of them were sick in various ways. Uh, it's, it's a true story, and it mm -hmm. follows this family, and they they all get well on a, just by switching to an organic diet. So it's really very good motivation for switching to an organic diet. Wow. Yes. So that could be your first, your first choice instead of going to pharmaceuticals. If you have Absolutely. health issues, try that first. And you know, I, even if you live in the city and you just have a small, you know, a, a small yard around your house, you can easily put in some raised beds Mm -hmm. And and just start by just growing what you love. You know, I think what is that's it? a terrific idea. Yeah, you know, do you eat a lot of tomatoes? Grow some mm -hmm. tomatoes. Do you really like garlic? Garlic's actually fun. I love growing garlic. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, whatever cucumbers, uh, peppers, whatever it is that you really, you know, it, you don't have to start big. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know about. I mean, I definitely stay away from non-organic blueberries and strawberries right. and, grape, and grapes because I know they're sprayed with a lot of pesticides. Now, right. I don't, they're probably not sprayed with glyphosate, but. Well, they might be. I was surprised that uh, there's glyphosate in wine. Um, so that's grapes. Uh, right. Zen Honeycutt, she's a, she's a great person, by the way. Moms Across America, she's a. Uh, totally about glyphosate. She has an organization called Moms Across America that she founded. Mm -hmm. She has three boys, um, 
who were get sick and she, she switched the family to an organic diet and they got well and she became a fanatic about glyphosate and she's really done a good job of trying to get that message out. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been testing different foods for glyphosate. She found it in orange juice and she found it in wine. She tested all kinds of California wines and they all tested positive. The biodynamics were much, much lower, but they weren't negative. So, I mean, it's right. like very, very hard to avoid because it's all over California. Right. Um, but that means the grapes, Some I think they're using glyphosate to control the weeds around the grapes and it's getting up into the grape plants, apparently. I was surprised because mm -hmm. I did think that fruit, fruits would be something that wouldn't have glyphosate, but I'm finding otherwise. Right. Yeah, I think they're finding newer and broader uses for it these days. Yeah, it looks that way. It's very scary. <sighs> Just too bad. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, Dr. Sneff, thank you so much. This is I really, really appreciate who you are. I appreciate your tenacity and your passion and your desire to look into this and to to educate people and help them in the work you Thank do. you so much for uh, having me on the show. Oh, you're very, very Enjoyed welcome. It. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening, and thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, for sharing your extensive expertise with us. I'm pretty confident that everyone listening will benefit. The podcast website is realjanine.com, where you can listen or, or download episodes and click on links to my guests' information. Sign up for the podcast bi-weekly blog newsletter to keep up on new episodes, archives, life updates, and always a new healthy recipe. And remember, Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N. And if you'd like to subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine, go to iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. And I have a Keeping It Real with Janine YouTube channel now uh, with video slideshows of my conversations. So I'd love it if you could go to YouTube and subscribe. Do you know someone who would benefit from my conversation with Dr. Sanef? Yes, you do. I know you do. Please share the love. Thanks for listening. Take care and bye.